Can we clap our hands to the Lord and bless Him in this place tonight? Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Oh, come on, let's put an encore on that and bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. You can be seated for just a brief moment. We're so glad to have our founding pastor and his family, the Tonys, with us. Amen. And his daughter and son-in-law and grandbaby. Amen. We're so thankful for their service in founding and starting the Church of Omaha on April 18th, 1999. Amen. Amen, amen. Why don't we give them a great big hand? Thank you, Jesus. I, I, I wonder how many people that heaven has recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life because of the Church of Omaha. Amen. Although some of these people aren't here, I'm going to mention these names, but we're thankful for the McGee's who served, the Sodans. The Stevens, Brother Rippy is here, his wife as well. They served, uh, uh, some of them under both Brother Tony and myself, and we're so grateful for their service and leadership. And, of course, the Kirkpatricks still serving, amen, the Wilders and the Coles as well in Jesus' name. All of our credentialed ministers tonight, thank you for coming and being a part of this. We appreciate and honor you and uh, are glad to be a part of the Nebraska District with you. I don't think there's any outside. I'm looking around. If I miss anybody that's outside of the Nebraska district, let me know, and I'll apologize later. Amen. Hallelujah. We're glad you're with us tonight. Because there is a TCOO, there's a daughter work tonight in Norfolk, Nebraska. Because there's a TCO, there's a daughter work in Nebraska City. Because there's a TCOO, there's a preaching point in Blair. Because there's a TCOO, a French African church was started and is tonight a self-governing church in Millard. Because there's a TCOO, there's a Spanish daughter work right here at the Church of Omaha. Because there's a TCOO, there's multiple P7 clubs that are started even by some of our children and young people. And this year, over 80 people have been taught a Bible study in the name of Jesus. Because there's a TCOO. We've come to celebrate Jesus. We've come to celebrate His church. We've come to celebrate who He is and all that He does. I'm excited for what God is going to do, for the ministry of the Word that's going to go forth. Amen. I do want to make a special announcement. Our young people are serving tacos after Brother Manuel is making them. You do not want to miss them. I promise you they are the best tacos you've ever tasted in your life. And they'll be inexpensive enough, and you'll bless you enough. But come downstairs if you can and partake of that after service. It's going to help our kids go to youth camp. At this time, our ushers are going to receive up an offering. If you can give, God bless you. If you want to give online, uh, there's a screen behind me that you can see. We've got a number that you can uh, 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 text to give uh, or as well use our online giving. We're glad you're here. Thank you for being here. Let's have church in Jesus' name. Clap your hands to the Lord. Oh, 
him up. Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We praise you, O God. You are holy. You are mighty. We are your people and the sheep of your pasture. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Go ahead and wave your hands to the Lord. Oh, this is his church. You're his people. Hallelujah. We are not our own, but we've been bought with a price. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Anything that you have need of, he's here right now. He's in the room. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. I'm sure that when you've seen me take the platform today, you might have had a little confusion because you want to know where Pastor Tony's glasses went. He had Lasix but, uh, just today, in fact. No, no. I'm just going to talk to you for a few moments, and then I have the honor of introducing our, the founding pastor of this church to you tonight. But before we get there, I, I do want to share a word with you from the Lord. You could turn to Romans chapter 1, verse 7. And it says, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, called to be saints. And what I want to talk to you just for a little bit tonight, Church of Omaha, is about being called to be, called to be. Today is our 25th anniversary kickoff service, and we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Church of Omaha, and and. Uh, in so many ways, this weekend truly is a celebration, but it's also a propelling forward. It's a looking back, and then it's a remembering where we came from and who we are and where we're going, and that we've been called to be, called to be saints. Brother and Sister Tony, I will not do this justice tonight. Ju nah. Justice tonight, that's the right word. Caitlin, I won't get it all right, and Brother and Sister Powell, Bishop, First Lady, I, I won't be able to even begin to touch on what it's like for people to pick up roots and to take a journey someplace and to say, hey, we're going to do something that God called us to do. And I think about it, and I, I think I've got the details right here, but it was down in the old market. You heard a word from God, and it was, hey, you're going to build a church here. You're going to plant a church, and and that church was called the Church of Omaha, like the Church of Ephesus and the Church of Rome and the Church of Corinth, named after the city that it was being founded in. But it started with a call. And what's fascinating about that, and I think all of us can relate to this in our lives, is when God comes and talks to us, He's not interested in telling everybody else around you. He's come to talk to you. He's come to let you know, hey, here's what I want for your life. And the noise of the world likes to speak in crowds and groups, and it likes to gather its media scene on in, and it gathers all the politicians, and it tells you what you can't do. But when God comes, He ignores all those things, and He speaks to you one-on-one. -on -one. And so a word came, and trust the Word of God, because He has purpose, and He has a plan, and nothing will prevent it. And and so that word came, and then one day God lets you all know it's time to go to Omaha. And when you came, you didn't have a Hilton to stay in. You had a trailer. And I thank you for that. I thank you for coming to Omaha, but it began with the word, and you came and you went to a settle in, and it started then church service in a conference room in a settle in for the first four months. From there, it progressed, and it Went to Winning Hoff Road, first one room, and then two, and then expanded. And you know what it's like to be in a storefront, and you say, man, we have 60 people now. We have 70 people now. We have 80. But do we have money for that building over there? We need more space. And as we looked around this Easter, and this room was full, and it was just over 200 people, and what did we say? 
We keep hitting that 170 and we're hitting that 200. We need more space. But when God calls, God, God has purpose and He has plan and His call is not wrong. Trust the call of God. And so the church grew and it grew and eventually uh, um, it moved in 2002 to this location. And the platform was right over here. So many of you weren't here for that. But right behind here is those windows that you see when you drive by on the road. Some of you already recognize that, and some of you are like, why is that wall bumped out just a little bit? The platform was there, and, and then in 2006, it was moved to be right up here. Why? To make more space. Why? Because God was calling more and more and more people. And that's just a short synopsis of what happened during that time. And, and during that time, there was numerous ministers that supported in the mission. We had the Stevens and the McGees and the Sodens and the Rippies. You were here at that time, and you were a bridge between them, the, the um, Tonys and the Pals. You were the first ones I called when I came here saying, hey, I'm coming to Omaha. Can I come to that church? I was going to try out other churches, but Pastor Tony, you said, this is the best church in town. I didn't try out another one. You know what else he did? I went to conference that year in Nebraska, and I found out it was for preachers only. Maybe he saw that I would stand up here one day. He leaned over, and he said, do you have a key to the church? I hadn't actually come on a Sunday yet. And I was like, what do you mean I have a key to the church? And he handed me a key, and he said, hey, I need you to go work down in the homeless shelters, and it was exactly what I needed. But in 2010, God's call came echoing in, and it said, hey, brother and sister Tony, I have a different mission for you. And while our hearts were broken, God had a plan because this is the church of the living God. And just because God decides that He's going to move individuals into different locations doesn't mean that God walks out on the plan that He started. But He said it's time for a new phase. And this is His body. And this is His church. And, and so you guys progressed on to Indiana and then to Kentucky and now to Florida because they don't like the snow. They don't like the snow. But meanwhile, God went far up north to where it's really cold and snowy. And Pastor Tony sat down with the pals, and he was like, if it's not you, we've got a problem. Because you're the only ones that God has given me. And they made that journey from Caribou, Maine, all the way to Omaha, Nebraska, where they didn't know anyone, and started out that same type of journey and said, we're going to trust you, God. And at the time, they didn't realize when they were first hearing the call that God had already prepared a way by taking an assistant pastor and some time previously and saying, hey, I want you to write a message, put it in this envelope, and hand it to Pastor Powell. Because when he's, it's time to open it, it will confirm the word to go to Omaha. I'm just thankful for the word of the Lord. Can we give him a hand clap? Bishop, you covered it very well. And during this time, since then, we've supported a work in Papillion. We now have a work up in Norfolk, Nebraska. Thank you, Brother Danny and Sister Rebecca, for that. Thank you for answering the call of God. We have a preaching point in Blair, Nebraska. And, and I remember in this church, as we begin to get more and more people from Togo, that we said, hey, there's a call of God here. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Quaggio. Let's give them a hand clap. And they answered the call. And we began to have service downstairs. And, and they even let me preach for a while. I did mine in Google. Uh, I put it all in Google Translator, and I changed it to God loves you. And that was really hard for me, by the way. And then we would give you a space to preach. And, and eventually, you guys followed the call, and now you pastor the church. And it's its own church, its own governing church. And I'm thankful for the work of the Lord. We now are starting a Spanish service, and, and Brother Mario, thank you for that, and Sister Priscilla, for doing the work of the Lord. And we meet here twice a month on Sunday for that, and it's growing and expanding. And there's much more to come, but, but what I want to just bring to you before I leave this pulpit is one more time to tell you that God said, and in, Paul said in the book of Romans, called to be saints. And 
That word saints there means a holy people. But it digs back into the Old Testament and it digs back into the children of Israel who were separated out and were the congregation in the wilderness and they were called to be. It wasn't Moses that the nation saw. They saw the children of Israel and they were afraid. The children of Israel were called out to be a witness to the world and to draw the world to Almighty God. That's what it means to be the people of God. But they were called to be and called to be holy. But being holy means that you're a separated people that go ahead and identify with God. Show His characteristics. Go through struggle and trial. Go through crises so that people can see God being like Him. Why? He says, be ye holy, for I am holy. In all situations and in all circumstances, we are called to be. And so I mentioned before that, that God may move individuals on and we have much ministry in this church and much that's gone before, but God has called each of you to be. And we preach on the fivefold ministry, but really it's the sixfold ministry because the fivefold is given to minister to the saints so that you can go into the world and minister so that you can be something in your school. You can be something on your job. You can be something in the aisles of Walmart and Hy-Vee. And you have been called to be. And so I don't know where you were at yesterday. I don't know what struggle you've gone through. And we have people from many different churches tonight. I don't know what it's like in your church service last Sunday. But I know that God called you. He planted you. And when he calls you, he intends to fulfill his call, and he protects his calling. And we've been called to be, called to be saints. Well, I won't go on and on. I could have an altar call, but I don't think anybody's ready to pray right now. But uh, I mentioned before, well, Pastor Tony's been in my life and the Tony family. And when I came here, I was going through a lot of things, and it was a monumental moment. And, and I remember how you gave me a job right away. You saw in me, you invested in me. I sat right back over there and said, what do you think if I get licensed? And you, and you said sometimes it starts with a desire. And so I really appreciate you, Pastor Tony. And, and you notice I refer to him often as Pastor Tony. It's not because he pastors this church anymore, but it's out of the respect for what you've been in my life. A mentor, a friend, an advisor, and you've been my pastor, and, and I thank you for that. And if you'd come to the platform right now, I'll hand you this mic. But uh, thank you for everything that you've done in the kingdom of God and what you've been in our lives and for my family and for this church. And we deeply appreciate you and we love you. Can't do it justice. Somebody shout praise the Lord. So in 1994, I preached Easter Sunday in Nebraska City, Nebraska for who was pastoring at that time, the Benteens. And, uh, and then on that following Tuesday, we came to Omaha, Nebraska, to Old Market, actually met up with some of the uh, brats at the time. And uh, we were downtown, and as Brother Lucas alluded to, I felt like I knew I wanted to plant a church somewhere when I went to Bible college. I, f I figured that much out. And so the Lord laid this place on our hearts or on my heart. I wasn't married yet. And I told my wife when we started getting serious I said, hey, we're going to go to Nebraska one day and start a church. And she was like, Nebraska? The world? And uh, first I had to learn how to spell it. And, uh, and so we finally got here in April the 18th, 1999, had our first service. And we, I was 25 years old. I was so young and dumb and had, did not have a clue what I was doing. Had no money. At that time, really had no real connections with people and just had a, my wife and we started with a nine-month-old daughter. And now I'm looking at a 10-month-old granddaughter that's back at the same time and that looks a lot like her mama did the first time I stood to preach at the Church of Omaha. So that's kind of a little reminiscent there. Uh, 
Somebody mentioned Norfolk, Rebecca. Rebecca's actually my second cousin. I don't know if people know that or if you claim that or not, but she's, <laughs> she's actually my second cousin, and so we thank God for that. I'll never forget having church in that basement and uh, just had no idea who was going to show up, what was going to happen, and we were like, we were there, and I'll never forget the first Sunday we had to set out chairs. Now, we manipulated that a little bit because we didn't put out a lot of chairs to begin with. That way, if a few people show up, you can tell all your friends, hey, man, we had to set out chairs today. But we had been running about 18 or 20, and something happened on that Sunday, and 37 people showed up in that basement. And I, listen, it, would have, it, it should have been 5,000 or something. I mean, it was, it was just incredible, and... We moved from the basement to that church on Winninghoff, the ugliest building in all of Omaha, Nebraska. Caitlin, you helped me paint that building. and uh, Never forget the service there where God delivered someone. We cast a devil out of a man. That started about a six-week period of, just for lack of a better term, deliverance. And we had on the platform, people just kept bringing vices and we had alcohol, we had cigarettes, we had shoe boxes full of marijuana. We had one guy bring 123 pornographic videos. V now, this is old school VHS tapes. You say, how did you know it was 123? Because I counted them things, man. I was like, and I kept them all on the platform for weeks upon end and just saw, saw God do great things and was on the end of a 21-day fast when I walked in this building for the very first time to just look at it. No way in the world we could afford this. We had $10,000 in the bank. And uh, when I stepped over that threshold, I just felt something. And I really felt like the Lord said, hey, this is going to be your building. And... Uh, I don't know how I didn't know how that was going to happen. I didn't know that was 21 days of fasting talking to me or that was the Lord talking to me. And um, but me and my wife started putting together stuff. I went I, I can't even tell you how many banks I went to asking for money. Now, if you want to get rejected and feel dejected fast, be a church planner with no money asking for a bunch of money. And uh, I would rebuke more bankers. I, I told more bankers, you're going to regret this. Shame on you. How dare you? Found one banker that said, hey, we'll, we'll start trying to work with you if you can come up with $185,000 cash. And uh, so I gave all my money. I think it was $37.16. And so I was like, well, I'm all in. And... Uh, Mine. I can say all this now because, but old sister Holloway that used to go to church here, she called me. She said, come by my house, and she gave me a $35,000 check. I've never seen so much money in all my life. And then another, Jeff and Rhonda Johnson was just a pivotal couple to help us when we got started it. Jeff said, come by my office. I went by his office. He slid a check over to me. I turned it over. It was a $150,000 check. I had $185,000. I've never seen so much money in all my life. And I went straight to the casinos in Council Bluff, and I turned that into $700,000, and God blessed us in a mighty, powerful way. And, uh, lost all of it, and we had to start. No, no. And that's how we got in this building. Uh, we had a note we couldn't afford, and but I look across and I see faithful people that helped us pay those notes, and I thank God for that. Um, Brother and Sister Powell, you've been here longer than I was ever here. This is your church. You've done a great job, been a great pastor, a great visionary. We appreciate that so very, very much. This church is 25 years old and it's only had two pastors. That's a good, that's a good, good, healthy sign. And I think you ought to honor the pastor of the church here. We 
He sold all that marijuana and that porn, that alcohol. And helped us remodel this place. And we thank God for that. Reason why we had to close up those windows because we had a we had a big old bird in the window one Sunday, it had a rat in its mouth. And I was up there trying to preach and people staring at a bird with a rat in its mouth. And I was like, well, we can we can fix that. So many great memories. But to my wife and to my daughter, who are champions, is the reason there's a church in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm going to ask you to give them a standing ovation, because if you could have just seen everything that we put on a good front, but there was a lot of stuff we went through to, to get us to where we are right here, and I thank God for that. Amen. Just remain standing. Grab your Bibles. Um, we were so We were so poor. We just never, never told Caitlin that, but <laughs> Caitlin never had an issue with home missions. She never had an issue planning a church. I look across Polly. Where, where's Polly? I remember your story. Polly was a hero in Omaha. Her and her kids were held hostage in their own home for over 10 years. Made the news. Some, our paths crossed. We began to teach Polly and her beautiful kids a Bible study and Art and Ida. I remember God starting a great revival. Visit me and Art. We did some lip syncing up here, bro, that the whole church thought we could sing. You remember that? We were the Pentecostal Millie Vanilli, brother. We had it. We had it. Anthony Pollocky, I'm praying God touches you and heals you from that Parkinson disease. But I remember the first time you ever raised your hands in this building and God filled you with the Holy Ghost, changed your life. Rich, we've built some platforms together, man. Man, I, you know what? I ought, to, I ought to come to Omaha and start a church. There's enough, there's enough remnant around here. I could have some people next Sunday, I think. We could stir something up. My goodness. My nephew is here, TJ. I had no idea he was in Omaha. He's working at Offutt Air Force Base, and he saw a post on uh, Facebook, and he said, are you in Omaha? And I said, I am. So he came, he came to go to church with me tonight, and I appreciate that. Stevens is, they're actually with us in Gainesville now. Brother and Sister Stevens is like a bad habit. You can't get rid of them. The McGee's are pastoring a great church in Louisiana. The Soden's pastoring a great church in Mississippi, the Rippies, pastor in a great church in Iowa. Our very first converts were Charlie and Donnie, Donna Gallardi. I tried to get a hold of them, see if they'd come tonight. A man that you don't know anything about has only ever been to one service that we wouldn't have had this building if it wasn't for a man by the name of Gene Rawhart. Just a realtor in town, very, very kind to me and my wife. But he called me one day and he said, I hear you need some guarantors. I said, I do. He said, I don't even know if I agree with your doctrine. He said, I've never been to your church. He said, but I believe in you. And he said, I've talked to my wife, and we're going to be a $250,000 guarantor for you. And uh, he put his neck on the line for this church. He's only been to one service. The very first service we had in this building, I, I, my knee went out of joint the night before, and I fell and broke my elbow. And preached the first sermon in this bill. Had a young man here helping us named Wayne Chenoweth. I said, Wayne, I need you to preach tomorrow. He said, I don't have time to get a sermon together. So I preached with a brace on one leg and an arm and a cast. And I was so drugged up that day. I think I proved the Trinity that day is what I preached. But we somehow survived. Hey, Brother Graham's going to be here tomorrow night. He's the real preacher. And he's going to get everything fixed. Sister Graham, I love you. And then when my wife endured that horrific mall shooting at Von Mar, on the one-year anniversary, Brother and Sister Graham invited us to St. Louis. They were pastoring there at that time. Now they're second man in charge of the UPC. Hey, big wigs. And, uh, but they invited us to St. Louis, and Brother Graham prayed over my wife, and God touched her that night. And she's never been the same. Amber, I remember the night she called me and said, Pastor, I just got the Holy Ghost. 
didn't even get the Holy Ghost at church. And where's Sister Cole at? Sister Cole, I preached some of the best sermons that's ever been preached in Pentecost, and you wouldn't get the Holy Ghost. And one Sunday, Brother Rippy comes up here to have kids revival, dressed up like a pirate, and all he does for 30 minutes is, ar, ar, and you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, what in the world is going on here? Stubborn. We were so young, but for all of you that were around, Melinda says, thanks for putting up with us. Thanks for loving my family. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 4. Now, I do want to preach. Is that all right? Where no oxen are, the crib is clean. In other words, if you want it to be tidy all the time, keep the oxen out. But much increase is by the strength of the ox. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean. But much increase. You've got to have oxen if you're going to have increase. Which means you're going to have to put up with a little bit of uncleanliness if you're going to have increase. My sermon tonight is keep the church a little dirty. Keep the church a little dirty. If you're going to help me preach, shout amen. God bless you. You may be seated. And then Caitlin got married. I forgot to mention something about my my son-in-law there. He wasn't here with us when we were in Omaha. I love Caleb. Caleb was one of the most talented individuals you'll ever meet in your life. They're one of the greatest power couples. Now, I know they're mine, but... I'm telling you what other people say, too. They're legit people, anointed of God, humble. I call him my grandbaby daddy. He's my grandbaby daddy. And uh, we love them, and they have really helped us so much in Gainesville, and I'm glad they're here with us this week. A year or so ago, the news was filled with images of deep space from the James Webb Space Telescope. If you got that picture, if you could put that up. It, it delivered the, the deepest images and sharpest infrared images of distant universes that, that we've, we've never seen before. It brought distant galaxies into sharp focus. And the article I was reading said this, as Webb's image offers a kaleidoscope of colors, and it highlights, you see that, kind of the... The cloudy part, it says it highlights where the dust is. Now listen to what the article said. Dust is a major ingredient for star formation and ultimately life itself. Notice what it said. Dust is a major ingredient for life. Without dust without dirt, without that substance that we work so hard to clean, remove, do away with, make sure is invisible and unseen. That's the exact substance that God is looking for and that is needed if there's ever going to be life. Understanding this makes Genesis chapter 2 an even greater revelation than it has normally been. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Dust is a major ingredient for life. God created life from the very dust and dirt of the earth. The wise man said, when the crib is void of oxen, it is clean. But much increase does away with that. In order to have increase, you're going to have to put up with a little dirt. And so on this 25th church anniversary, I implore you, TCOO, keep the church a little dirty. Remember what this is all about. Remember that our aim is to reach the lost and the hurting. Thank 
God for everything in the past, but there's a greater in our future. There is a more, there's more in our tomorrow unto Him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. I've looked around Omaha the last few days. I see a lot of dirt. I see a lot of dirt being moved. You know what that means? This is a place for life. This is a great place for revival. This is a great place for God to pour out His Spirit. Now to Brother Anthony and to Brother Show Walter. I apologize for what Brother Kirkpatrick said, how I lured him to come to our church when I said that we were the best church. If you, if you look up the word best uh, in the Greek, what it meant at that time was that we were just the neediest church at that time. We just needed some help here. And so I'm, I was young, guys. Forgive me for that. But, but I hope you think your church is the best, too. Right, 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 right. I guess it's the time to say, if anybody wants to move to Florida. No, uh, no, 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 no. There's just something about dust and deity that works good together. It's interesting to consider that every person in this room, regardless of your social status, your pedigree, your financial portfolio, irrespective of how good you think you look, and every, every person... Every person in this room came from dust. So if we're ever tempted to be arrogant or to think of ourselves higher than we are, it would be, it would be in our best interest to reconsider and reread Genesis chapter 2 because it's a good reminder that every single one of us has some dirt underneath our fingernails. Somebody shout dirt. And yet God is attracted to to us. No celestial substances, no heavenly ingredients, nothing of any value, just dirt. It does not matter how new you are in the church or if you've been here since the Big Dipper was a small cup. We're all just a dirt ball that's been breathed upon by the mighty, powerful presence of God. And when it's all said and done, we will return back to dust. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, we will return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and dust thou shalt return. So go ahead and just look at the person to your left and, and, and look at the other one to your right. And, and, and if you got somebody behind you, look at them. If you got somebody in front of you, look, look at them. Because you may think that we don't have anything in common. But the one common denominator among us is we're all just dirt. Just flesh, just dirt. Nothing special about us. And it's interesting. It's interesting to me when we consider all the things we do for our dirt. We spend money on our dirt. People put makeup on their dirt. Dress up our dirt. Billions of dollars are spent every year to make dirt look less dirty. People get surgery on their dirt. We try to improve the dirt. We get dirt lifts, dirt suction. Dirt tuck. We get our dirt manicured, pedicured, exfoliated. We get facials on our dirt. We even like for people to massage our dirt. But at the end of the day, it's just dirt. However, God does every, everything with beauty, with splendor, and with excellence. If you've ever seen a sunset, you've seen the handiwork of God. If you've ever seen a waterfall, you've seen the craftsmanship of God. If you've ever seen the stars and the moon as they shine in the dark, you've seen the splendor of God. God does everything with excellence and with majesty. But when it came to man, His eternal creation, 
his prized possession, the vessel that would house his spirit, his man-made masterpiece. He just used dirt. Now, as the interior designer of heaven, he did the gates in pearl. He did the streets in gold. He did the seas in crystal. He did the walls in jasper. But when he made us, he just used dirt. And instead of being offended at this, we should be encouraged by this. Because God wanted us to know from the very beginning that even though He is deity, He's not afraid to work with us who are dirty. And that's good news because every one of us in here can be used by God. We serve a God that's awesome, but He's not afraid to work with awful. We worship a God that's incredible, but He's not afraid to... Come alongside insignificant. We love a God that's dynamic, but he's not afraid to get his hands dirty and dusty. And and when you get down to it, this is why we praise him the way we praise him. Because he didn't have to do it, but he did. I didn't bring anything to the table, but God reached down and breathed into this dirt ball. Come on, you ought to get excited tonight and clap your hands. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. We built this church with some dirty people. We built this church with some people struggling with sin. We built this church with people that made mistakes. But God was attracted to the dirt because that's what's needed for life. I wonder if I got any dirt balls that's excited that God breathed in you the breath of life. Now I'm just going to act like I'm at home, all right? I'll leave tomorrow. You'll be fine. We got to be careful, Pentecostals, because it's right here now. We're 25 years old. We've been around a little bit. If we're not careful, we'll find ourselves in a dangerous place. Because we might be at a season where it might be easy to turn our nose up on other people and say things like, uh, you don't want anything to do with them. They're dirty. They talk dirty. They watch things that are They tell dirty jokes. Careful. Because God has never thought like that. His thought has always been, bring me that dirt. Bring me that dust. That's what's needed for life. And that dirt that you think is insignificant, worthless, that you're trying so hard to sweep out of the house... God says, I can put my hands on that, and I can shape it, and I can form it, and I can con- add and pull and put. And when I breathe on it, the thing you was trying to get rid of, God says, that's my next pastor. That's my next missionary. That's my next church planner. Let me help somebody. Your dirt doesn't scare God. Your dust doesn't disqualify you from grace. And if we're going to experience the kind of revival that God wants us to have, then the next 25 years, we better make sure we keep the church a little dirty. Let's get us some sinners. Let's get us some people that need to know about the grace of God. God will clean you up. God will fix you. God will take care of you. But you got to come in just like you are. While we were yet sinners. Quit trying to be perfect before you let God use you. Quit trying to clean yourself up good enough. You're just dirt. He's attracted to dirt. He's attracted to that. He doesn't need a perfect situation to work with. He doesn't need perfect people to work with. As a matter of fact, 
The only time in Scripture where God required perfection before using anybody were those that He said, if there's any among you without sin. The only thing that God was looking for perfection in is rock throwers. So for all you perfect people, you're about to kill the revival that God's trying to bring. But for all of you that could have the revelation, we're all sinners, saved by grace. For you that are not perfect, put your rock down and understand what the psalmist meant when he said, He knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dead us and all of us need to remember that we were just lost and undone and the reason why many churches are dead is because there's no dirt there's no sinners, there's no issues, there's no problems and every time somebody comes in they sweep them right back out of the door but I want to tell you on this 25th anniversary let's keep it a little dirty let's just keep give God something to work with Where there are no oxen, the church is clean. But where there's great increase, there's going to be a smoking section. Where there's great increase, there's going to be an issue over here. There's going to be some drugs over here. There's going to be some problems over here. But God says, that's what I need to build a church. Somebody shout amen. Hey, you know why? You know why the Dead Sea is dead? The Dead Sea is dead because it has too much salt. Jesus, and this won't be the first time I ever take a scripture out of context. We built a church on this. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. And when it gets too salty in here, just like a fish trying to swim into the Dead Sea, it cannot survive because the salt content is too great. What are you saying, Pastor? We don't need Pentecostals. Oh, no, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying we need to take the worst of the worst. They need to get converted. God needs to shape them up, change them like only He can change them. They need to become everything they're supposed to be, and then we need to go get us some more. And we need to make sure that we keep the content. And the, I don't know what the ratio is, but I do know this. Sometimes Pentecostals are too Pentecostally. <laughs> and sometimes we're too perfect. And we're too this, that, and the other. And God says, no, if you can keep a little dust there, if you can keep a little dirt there, that's what I will use to breathe. How many remember the woman that was called in the act of adultery? And they brought her to Jesus. Now, we've always kind of preached that, like, like they, you know, Jesus walking down the road, and they bring this woman and said, hey, We caught her in the act of adultery. That's not what your Bible says. That's what the Bible says in John chapter 8, verse 2. It says, early in the morning, he came again into the temple. He's at the church house. And all the people came unto him and sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman that was taken in the act of adultery and set her in his midst. So, so where are they? They're in the temple. They bring the woman to church. I don't care what your motive is. Be careful when you start bringing people to church. God touches people when they're brought to church. And the Bible says that he got down in the temple and begin to write in the dirt on the ground. There was enough dirt in the temple that day. We can vacuum it up. Calm down. It's going to be all right. There was enough dirt in the temple that day for him to get down and begin to move it around and write. Thank God he didn't get to a church that day that was perfect. Thank God they didn't bring her to a church that day where they didn't have any dirt anywhere. But when she saw that there's dirt here, Jesus said, hey, I can touch you. Listen to me, there's still there's thousands and thousands of people uh, in this city that's waiting on somebody to bring him to where Jesus is. Uh, and it's okay if there's a little dirt. You know, 
I can't preach without a prop. And so Jesus began to write in the ground. And it began to, whoo, I hope this comes up. If not, we'll, we'll get some more. That's be fine. And he just begins to play in the dirt. You see, if you're going to really help people, you got to quit being afraid to get your hands dirty. If you're going to really get down to where people are, you, you, got, you can't be afraid to get your hands dirty. He stooped down. And he began to write on the ground. A little dust in the temple. Now, this is significant because in Numbers chapter number 5, the Bible says that the priest would take holy water. Now, I'm not going to do that. But that he would take water. And then he would take the dust off the floor of the temple. And he would mix the holy water with the dirt that was on the temple. And if, she, if, if someone was accused of doing something they shouldn't do, they would take this. And, and if they had committed adultery, her stomach would swell. And she would no longer be able to have children. And God would take holy water. And he would mix it with the dust of the temple. And that would bring about, listen to me, revelation to the people. We work too hard to make sure. Everything is perfect at the church. Thank God there's some holiness here. But thank God there's some dirt here too. Because when that holiness hits with that dirt, it brings about revelation. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean. But much increase is by the strength of an ox. Revival is messy. It's dusty. It's dirty. It can mess up image of a good church. Paul said it like this, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silk. So if we're going to have a great church, we've got to have some gold and we've got to have some silver. But you also got to have some wood and some earth. You got to have some wood uh, and you got to have some dirt uh, and you got to have some honor and some, some to dishonor. That's what Paul says a great church. A great church is not a church full of just a bunch of Pentecostals. A great church is a church full of saved people, unsaved people, clean people, and dirty people, uh, lost people, and found people. Oh, God, aren't you glad when you came to church uh, you didn't have to come clean? Uh, you could come dirty. What are you doing? I just want to see if we can have revival here. I just want to see, is there a little dirt out here? Come on, you know I could come to some of you and start marking on you. I could find some dirty people up in. Where's Polly at? I could no, no, I could find some dirty. Where's Rich at? I could I could find some dirt on some people in here. But you know what God says? That's what I need. That's what I need. That's what I'm attracted to. If that's what I made the first man out of, uh, that's what I'm going to make the next one out of. If that's what I did the first time to begin to populate and them to take them in, that's what I want to do in Omaha. Bring me your dirt. Bring me your pain. Bring me your problems. Bring me your troubles. God's not finished with you yet. Say, Pastor, I'm not as clean as I need to be. God's not finished with you yet. I'm not where I need to be. God's not finished with you yet. This lady, this lady was changed and delivered and set free because somebody took her to church that had a little dirt on the floor. There's a story in your Bible that says a man had an unclean spirit and it left him. And the Bible says he findeth the devil comes back and finds that man. Listen, this is what your Bible says. Empty, swept, and garnished. It appears that God wasn't attracted to the cleanliness. But the devil was. 
too many times we try to come to God cleaning out our own lives. When you try to clean up your own self, you know what that is? That's legalism. When you try to clean up your own self, you know what that is? That's works. You're trying to work for your salvation. That's you thinking you are God. And you know what that does? That only attracts more devils. The man was clean, empty, swept, and garnished. And the devil said, I'm going to go back there. And I'm going to take seven more. Worse than me. And that man's state was worse than it was before. And so when you, But when you come to God just like you are. Just like the lady caught in the act of adultery. When you come to God dirty and dusty. God is attracted to that. And he will feel that. He will breathe on that. John chapter 9. And Jesus passed by and saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind. Jesus said, Neither neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now listen to verse 6. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground. Now we'd have found another church right there. Like we honestly, we would have we would have got online and started Googling. Churches where the preacher doesn't spit. He spat on the ground, took a little bit of that dirt, and took a little bit of that holy water out of his mouth and mingled that together and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said, go wash And he went his way and washed and came seeing. Can you imagine your pastor, Pastor Powell, you come up for prayer on Sunday. And he pours out some dirt. And then he spits on that dirt. And then he begins to form that in his hands. And then he just pushes that in your face. The Bible says Jesus anointed his eyes with dirt. Most of us want to be anointed, but not with spit and dirt. We would have quit church. We'd have quit following Jesus. We'd have sued the organization. We'd have wrote a post on Facebook about that. We'd have hashtag church hurt all day long. We would have let everybody know there's something crazy going on down there. Let me remind you, you may not agree with his method, but the miraculous is undeniable. Jesus spit in the dirt, placed it in the blind man's eyes, and he was healed. Spit contains the DNA of the person. That's why they can swab your mouth and figure out who you are. Spit contains the DNA of a person. And when Jesus spit on that dirt, the DNA of deity was mixed with the dirt on that ground. And dust is what's needed for life. And it produced a miracle that particular day. Who am I preaching to tonight? Let God anoint your clay. Let God anoint your dust. Let God take your worst and turn it into something good. The Bible says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. All things work together for good. Just like God made Adam out of dust and breathed on him. God can take your pain. God can take your sin. God can take your addiction. God can take the unclean things and breathe the Holy Ghost over you and begin to give you a miracle. I don't know about you, but I'm glad God breathed on me. I'm glad God put some DNA in the dirt of my soul. Let's all stand. It's what's needed for life. You're here today and you're dirty. You're at a church that's not scared of your dirt. 
We're not afraid to get dirty with you. Hey, you can't teach people Bible study without getting a little bit of dirt on them. Right? Right? Yeah, but I got my good suit on. It's just dirt. Look at that picture there, just dirty. Aren't you glad Jesus wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty that day? So I got a little dirt on me. A little white shirt may not be as white. A little nice suit may not be as clean now. I got to get to the cleaners. But this is what happens when you start when you start working with people. It's what happens when you walk into the homes of people and begin to flip a Bible study chart. It's what happens. You got you got to put up with some stuff. Now, listen, the Church of Omaha is built on apostolic foundation. I get all that. We want to be Pentecostal from the top of our head to the southeast corner of our big toe. But as much Pentecostal as we're going to be, we also have to be that much patient with everybody else. Because people are dirty. They don't understand things. And you're going to have to get down where they live. And you're going to have to not be afraid to, to, to let them see that you're one of them. And if God can take your dirt, and turn it into a temple and just maybe I know we're here celebrating we got a whole weekend to do that and Brother Graham one of the best preachers you'll ever hear but I'll say this I say this everywhere I go the greatest preacher you ever hear is not somebody who's going to come in and preach to you the greatest preacher you ever hear is your pastor it's the greatest pre- preacher you ever hear Graham's come. He's a great preacher, but but the greatest preacher you're going to hear is Pastor Graham. But if you're here tonight and you feel like your life is dusty, dirty, and unclean, God wants to breathe on your situation right now. You're not where you need to be with God and you've got every excuse in the world. Well, as soon as I get this fixed, preacher, as soon as I get that fixed, preacher, as soon as I do this, preacher, as soon as I get this taken care of, I'll God doesn't want you like that. God wants you to just come to Him dirty. Because here I am, God. Just a filthy, dirty. I want to challenge you tonight. Keep your eyes on the harvest. Let's keep the church a little dirty. Let me tell you one more thing about dirt. telling Caleb, I said, Caleb, I wish you could see this place in a couple of months, man, because we was driving out toward Lincoln when preaching with Brother Huffman Wednesday night. Love that so much. I think of Brother Huffman. I think like Brother Huffman. Brother Huffman is an apostle to Lincoln. He just went there and planted a church and stuck it out. I respect that highly. I was telling Caleb, I said, hey, you know, all on the side of the road here in the interstate, in, in a couple of months, that's going to be nothing but corn. dirt listen to it here's what I know about harvest you can't have a harvest without a seed being placed God doesn't lay that seed six inches off the dirt he said no we're going to break up that fallow ground we're going to put that seed in the dirt and it looks like we're burying it it looks like we're getting rid of it. It looks like we're covering it up. But that's the only way that seed can grow. It's to burst through that dirt. Tonight, you may not walk out of here with a harvest, but you need to give God your dirt. And you need to let God put a seed in you. And you need to let God plant His power and a promise in you tonight. And so in three months, when all of a sudden something begins to break through that hardness of your heart and begins to break through that ground. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, when I realize I'm just dirt, then I am strong. 
this is what's needed for life. Why don't you slip your hands up all over this place right now? There are two things that makes God angry. It's when sinners try to act like saints and when saints try to act like sinners. So you don't have to act like anything you're not tonight. If you've got some dirt in your life, you don't have to hide it. You don't have to cover it up. You don't have to try to sweep it out. Bring that to God. Let Him put a seed in you. Every church has got to have some dust. Every revival has got to have some dust. If we keep the crib clean, we're going to have no increase. But much increase requires some oxygen. So we're going to have to put up with some dirt. We're going to have to put up with some stuff. You remember when you came into the church dirty? Aren't you thankful God accepted you? You remember when you came in? Holiness is what we're all striving for. But we all start dirty and dusty. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Come on, TCOO, I want to encourage you. Keep the church a little dirty. Go find you a Bible study. Go find you somebody and bring to church. Bring in the hurting, the lame, the withered, the halt. Let them know an angel's going to show up here one service and somebody's going to get healed. Come on, if you need healing in your body, I want you to step out of where you are. If you need God to do a work in your life, I want you to step out of where you are. I want you to come to this front. You don't have to be perfect. Nobody's going to throw a rock tonight. We're just going to throw our hands up and ask God to take our dirt. Come on, Maria. Let God touch you one more time. God, in the name of Jesus, let the Holy Ghost touch her one more time, God. Come on, don't waste this altar call. I was just dirty, but he touched me. Come on, some of you ought to throw your hands up. Say, God, take my mess. Take my dirt.
forget where Jesus brought me from. In one of Peter's epistles, he mentions that there are some who forget. They're far-sighted. They, it's, they, they can't remember that God has forgiven them. Their sin. I never want to get to that place. I want to be constantly reminded that at the end of the day, he worked with me in my dirt. He can work with somebody else's. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But Tony, thank you for just hitting the bullseye. Robin Hood could hit the bullseye and then split that arrow. And that's kind of what you did tonight. You just, just Brother Robin Hood tonight, man, just bullseye and then split the arrow again. So what a word from the Lord. Amen. Not just anointed, but appointed. Praise God. I do want to remind you again on behalf of our uh, youth ministries, they are going to be raising some money for youth camp. So if you can come down and get some tacos, I think they also have some to-go uh, things. Did you get those? No, you did? Mm, you did. Okay, well, whatever. But you can get some tacos, and and, and we'll figure it all out. But um, it's going to be, I'm telling you, Brother Manny can flat cook tacos, okay? I'm telling you, it's going to be great. Ain't another restaurant in town going to do it as good as that. But anyway, God bless you, all of our ministers and uh, visiting churches. Thank you for being here. Some of you travel from out of town. Thank you for coming. God bless you tomorrow night at 6 p.m. in Jesus' name.